It's my great pleasure to welcome to the stage the Master of Ceremonies for tonight's award, one of India's most famous international actors, the villain who battled James Bond in Octopussy, a voting member of the Oscars Academy, and a knight of the Italian Republic. Please join me in welcoming Kabir Bedi. What a glorious gathering we have here on the lawns of this historic Biggie Palestine Jaipur. Chief Guest, International President of Tony International, John Rasmus Paul, our special guest, Gloria Steinem, founder members of the BSC Prize for South Asian Literature, Mr. H.S. Narula and Mr. Serena Narula, Directors of the Z Jaipur Literature Festival, William Gallerinko and Amita Gokhale, members of the jury, writers of the world, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. As you know, our chief guest originally was supposed to be the Honorable Minister for Human Resource Development, Mr. Shashi Tharoor. Tragically, his wife, Sunanda Tharoor, passed away yesterday, and to convey our feelings, I'd like to call on just a moment of respectful silence to share his sorrow at this tragic time. We are with him in spirit in this time of grief. Welcome to the award ceremony where we will, we will announce the winner of the prestigious BSC Prize for South Asian Literature. literature 2014. This ceremony is being held in conjunction with the Z Jaipur Literature Festival, which is the most exciting and respected literary extravaganza in the entire Asia Pacific region. The DSC Prize for South Asian Literature honors the best writing about the South Asian region and celebrates its multicultural writings and translations into English with a prize of $50,000. It is, in a word, the world's most coveted award for South Asian writing. This can be writing about all matters concerning South Asia by South Asian writers, or by people who are not even South Asian writers, but are writing about South Asian stories. So, to begin the evening, I'd like to invite on stage founder members of the BSC Prize, H.S. and Serena Nerula. Please come on stage. H.S. Nerula, H.S., as everyone knows him, is the chairman of BSC, which has major business interests in infrastructure, hospitality, trading, retailing on four continents. But what has been remarkable is his support for literature, especially South Asian literature, over the years. Serena spearheads the literary and philanthropic initiatives of the group and beyond South Asian literature, please come. Serena and Ajayas Nerula, please welcome them. Serena also works tirelessly for the welfare of three children around the world and for her tireless efforts, she was awarded the MBE. May I call on Serena to say a few words at the beginning of this award function. Serena. A very good evening to all of you. On behalf of the Narula family and DSC, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all here today. The DSC Prize was instituted in 2010, and as you all know, it is open to authors of all nationalities who write about South Asia. The only objective in instituting this prize was to encourage excellence in literature about issues affecting this part of the world. I just found out at lunch today that the Booker Prize has just opened up to international entries this year, so we were open four years ago. 
Um, the process of judging the DSC Prize is long and involves jurors from all over the world. It starts with entries coming in and jurors are selected from an international community. Uh, our advisory committee is also international, which selects the jurors. This year, 30% of the entries came from UK, USA, Canada, and Australia. I would like to see this grow to a much higher level. All the international publishers here tonight, please make it more inclusive, and we want to see some names for not only from the South Asian region, from, but from the rest of the world. As a social anthropologist, I think it is possible to be from any part of the world and write a great novel about South Asia. Our five member jurors had to read up to a hundred books and create their own list, which is then compiled into a long list after their first meeting and announced in New Delhi. Then they gather in London in November to announce the short list in a ceremony held in different venues. In the past years, it used to be held in the Shakespeare Globe Theatre. This year, it was held in the Bernard Shaw Library in London School of Economics, thanks to Dr. Mukulika Banerjee, the head of the South Asian uh, Centre at LSC. I'm grateful to the five-member jury and all of you who have helped us with the prize. And thank you, John Ralston Sowell. Uh, and Gloria for giving away the prize. And thanks to Namita, Sanjoy, and William for giving us the opportunity to sponsor the festival for the last five years. And finally, hello, can you hear me? <laughs> and finally, thank you, Gloria, for your lifetime work because of which I'm standing here today. Thank you. Well, whenever there are major victory awards, the question is, who decides the award? Who decides who wins? A very distinguished jury in our case, that's who. And it's my pleasure to introduce you to the luminaries who worked so diligently to find the worthy winners of this year's DSC Prize for South Asian Literature. A truly international jury and I'll request them to come on stage one by one as I call out their names. But to start with, I want to say that it's unfortunate that Rosie Boycott, one of our jurors, uh, could not be here. Not that she's boycotting the event, she just couldn't be here for good reasons. But Rosie is a journalist, a writer, an editor. She also founded a feminist magazine called Spare Rib. She was trustee of the Hay Festival, has been a judge of many famous international literary prizes, and we just wanted to know that Rosie, we missed you. So the first juror I would like to call upon stage is Amina Saeed. She's the managing director of Oxford University Press in Pakistan. In 2010, she founded the Karachi Literature Festival, and recently the first Islamabad Literature Festival in 2013. For her many distinguished services to literature, Amina was awarded the Order of the British Empire in 2005 and received a French knighthood, becoming a Chevalier in 2013. A big hand for Amina Sayyid. Thank you. Arshia Sattar is a writer, reviewer, teacher, writer. Her writing has been published by Penguin Books, and she was shortlisted for the Crossword Vodafone Non-Fiction Award, and she teaches Indian literature and Indian abroad, has been on many international juries. She also co-founded the Sangam House International Residency Program near Bangalore, which has hosted nearly a hundred writers from India and abroad. So a big hand for Ashya Sattar. Paul Yamazaki has been a bookseller since 1970. For more than 30 years, he has been the principal buyer of the City Booksellers, which was named by Publishers Weekly as Bookseller of the Year 2010. 
Yeah, my wife is also a member of the eminent jury that selected 21 writers that comprised the Granta Best Young American Writers in 2007. Warm welcome, sir. Antara Bersen is the chairperson of the jury. She's also the founder editor of The Little Magazine, the first Indian magazine to focus on contemporary South Asian literature and offer it in English translations. She's a literary critic, a translator, a newspaper columnist and commentator, commenting on and writing about media, society, politics, culture, and development. A big hand for Antara. She's also edited several books, including a TLM short story from the South Asia series. So, with that introduction to our wonderful jury, I call on the chairperson to tell us all that happened behind the closed doors of the jury room. Well, not all, just the, the fun bits. Please come and tell us all that you can. Thank you very much. I must say that I'm extremely honored to be on the stage here with you and with everybody else here. And it's just a wonderful opportunity, especially because the books that you read were so wonderful. So thank you all. I can't tell you what happened, everything that happened, uh, but I'll give you a fair idea of how, how we got around it. I've also been asked to talk a bit about South Asian literature. So whether you like it or not, I will. Um, what exactly is South Asian literature? It's basically literature from South Asia. This includes literature from India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, Sri Lanka, and also sometimes from Burma, Bhutan, Tibet, the Maldives, and Afghanistan. So that's about 10 countries. And 10 countries together give you an awful lot of languages. India alone has 24 literary languages. So maybe instead of South Asian literature, we should call it South Asian literature. However, for the moment, because there are many things that bind South Asian literature together, we can look at it as a singular. Um, perhaps what binds South Asian literature together and gives it this identity is its shared languages, shared values, shared heritage of a rich, powerful, ancient civilization, shared memories of colonialism, traumas of conflict, migration, violence, marginalization, sectarianism, societal exclusion, and, of course, poverty. It reflects the enormous political and economic changes the region is going through, and with the emergence of the post-colonial identity, of course, the uh, South Asian literatures are also going through several other changes. And as South Asia becomes a regional power, the acceptance of South Asian literature changes as well. The DSC Prize is, is unique because it takes a very generous view of South Asian literature. The author doesn't need to be South Asian by birth or ethnicity. The book needs to be about South Asia. Uh, we the jury received 65 nominations, and it was actually 65, we called it the Mountain of Books, and, and we, we actually enjoyed uh, going, eating our way through the Mountain of Books, um, and we were very privileged because so many of those books were really great reads, and we were also very privileged because as jury members, we, we uh, bonded somehow. It was, we had this wonderful uh, chemistry, as they call it, and we became friends, and it was very easy thereafter to, to judge. So the way we judged it was, um, of course, it's not easy to judge literature because gut response is justified by fixing criteria, focusing on style, idiom, theme, plot, structure, characterization, originality, and other factors. While drawing up the shortlist, jury members leaned on all these criteria and still had justifiable differences of opinion, which were sorted out through informed, if sometimes impassioned, debate. The longlisted books were 15, and they were enchantingly diverse. From there, we got down to a shortlist 
of six, um, which the shortlist sort of offers the heart of South Asia in all its cultural, linguistic, ethnic, and religious diversity. These happily include two novels in translation from languages other than English. Hopefully, as publishers get more interested in translations and translations get more professional, future shortlists will include more books from South Asian languages other than English. This year, the jury was forced to abandon some superbly crafted, smart, and stylish novels as we chose six beautiful books from India, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka, each a window opening onto the complexity of the South Asian experience, people by identities shaped by the violence of poverty, conflict, terrorism, migration, caste prejudice, and gender discrimination. So we have in the shortlist half a dozen expressions of the restive edginess that emerges from the relentless friction between eternal verities, rapid change, and indomitable hope. Much of the exhilarating and bewildering diversity of South Asia is reflected in these six books, and you will shortly get a glimpse of them. Curiously, almost all of these books are about violence, underscoring what the contemporary South Asian experience is inescapably defined by. Almost all examine otherness due to migration, caste identity, terrorism, or just alienation. But through extraordinary storytelling and sensitivity, these six novels offer us a sense of history, a sense of loss, and the invincibility of hope. We were very privileged to read this book. Thank you. You know, as I said, in the beginning there was words, and that's what writers do with words. And as Ayn Rand said, words are a way of focusing one's mind. But beyond that, there's the whole world of imagination that the writer has to deal with, to create something out of nothing, just out of thoughts, feelings, observations, experience skill of writing, expressing. And as Sidney Sheldon said, a blank piece of paper is God's way of telling us how hard it is to be God. Because that's what it comes down to that flight of imagination, which is the realm of the writer. As Joseph Conrad said, only in men's imagination does every truth find an effective an undeniable existence. Imagination, not invention, is the supreme master of art as life. And then, of course, what Shakespeare said, as imagination goes forth the form of things unknown, the poet's pen turns them to shape and gives to airy nothing a local habitation and a name. Somebody said, I don't know if Francis Bacon wrote the works of Shakespeare or not, but if he did not, he missed the opportunity of a lifetime. We are dealing with six wonderful writers here, six finalists that are before us today. So let's take a look at these six great books which made it to the rigorous readers to be shortlisted for this year's DSP Prize for South Asian Literature. First, I'll just read the names of the six finalists and their books, and after that, I'll ask the authors to, and their translators, if there are, to come up on stage. So please don't come rushing up the first time you hear, you hear your name. The names of the six finalists are Anand for the Book of Destruction. Benjamin for Goat Days, Cyrus Mystery, Chronicles of Pope Bearer, Mohsin Hamid, How to Get Filthy Rich in Rising Asia, Nadine Aslam, The Man's Garden, Naomi Monadera, Island of a Thousand Meadows. 
So now you can give them a collective appreciation. Let's have a hand for all of them collectively for having been the finalists, the six finalists. I now call upon the writers and translators, wherever they are, to come on stage and speak about the book briefly, also to read a bit from the book so you get the feel and flavor of the book, which is so important. So please welcome Anand and his translator, Chetna Sachidanandan, for the book of destruction. Anand is an engineer by profession and has written a number of novels, uh, short stories, as well as studies of philosophical and social interest. He's won the prestigious Sahitya Academy Awards and the English translation of his novel, The Resident Travel, won the Crossword Award. Please welcome Anand. As well as the translator, Chetna Sachidanandan. So, uh, are they going to be given separate microphones? <coughs> Where's the extra microphone that is here? Oh, can you pass the microphone? Mm -hmm. So, I read a, a tagline on your book which said, um, Murder committed for its own sake, which was very intriguing. And I would love it if you could share what that meant as well as read from the book. Good evening, everybody. The book of destruction is the name of my novel. Now, I will speak a few words about my book, what my novel is. Violence has it has already been said the main theme of most of the writings here. Violence, senseless, illogical, and mindless violence is the theme of my novel. In my attempt to understand this phenomenon, okay, so, in order to understand this phenomenon, Anthropologically, I look at three kinds of people from history. One, thugs, who are known for deception and ritual killing. Two, Hashishins, or Pidain. Hashishin is the original word from which assassins happen. Hashishins, or Pidain, who are the do and die people. That is, they kill themselves along with the victims. Three, the religious and political ideologues who tailor uniforms for their followers and force them into dumb and remove all individuals they have suffered from the kids. My proposition is that all these people still exist in our society in various ways. You scratch the surface of a religious preacher or a political leader, businessman, journalist, or even a writer, and you may find a thug, a hashishin, or a master tailor beneath. Now, a few lines I will read from the original text. And I am in Malayalam. Ingenayana Sambhavan Kodagunada. For all Nagaratil Vandadin station, Uru Hotel is checking the evening. Satan Muriel Vetsu Pulitz, Nagarat Kendi, Vegu Narat and Vilitsum, Vayu Masurika Manakari, Muri Adaki Vegu Vetsaran. I think that is enough to give a sense of my language. Now, um, um, Satan will read a portion of English. A 
traveler comes to a city and checks into a hotel. He unpacks, has a bath, and heads out for some fresh air with the intention of exploring the city. Evening sets in, the street lamps turn on one by one. Lights begin to appear in the windows. Suddenly he realizes that he has forgotten to take the card of the hotel and he does not have any memory of its name now. He has already walked quite a bit and appears to have lost his way. After several failed attempts to locate his hotel, he goes into a nearby uh, hotel and approaches the front desk. He tells the receptionist there his story and gives her, to the best of his ability, a description of the hotel he had checked into. The girl gives him a white grin and informs him that this is his hotel. Does he not remember? He is positive it is not. It was not such a tall building for one, and it had no garden in the front as this one has. Moreover, contrary to the girl's claim, he was confident that it was not she who had checked him in. The person who had checked him in was a morose young man wearing a white shirt and a tie, and the girl here was nowhere in sight at that time. When he continues to protect her smile face, she hands him the key to his room, and with her friend, points in the direction of the lift with an imperiousness that makes him uneasy. He submits, takes the key, summons the lift, and goes to room number 412 as indicated on the key. To his extreme surprise, he finds all his belongings inside, innocently arranged, just as if he might have left them there. The clothes he had changed out of were in the wardrobe. The book he was reading was on the bedside table. But he is still certain this was not the room he had checked into. The bed sheets were different for one. There had been only one window in the old room, while this room has two. But he couldn't argue with the fact that all his belongings were here. This is not a story I have constructed for your entertainment. It was an experience a friend of mine had. Well, can't really call him a friend, not even a proper acquaintance. I have had occasion to meet this man maybe four times, always in the birth opposite mine, in various railway courses in which I have traveled over a period of many years. Thank you. Uh, just now, could you remain on stage, please? Because Serena Marilla will like to lend you a memento uh, for the occasion, which we will be presenting to all the finalists. Um, and I know they're doing in the finals. So, first of all, memento, rather. To both the writer and the translator. Thank you very much. I'd now like to call on Benjamin and his translator, Joseph Poipale, for Goat Stories. Benjamin has lived in Bahrain since 1992. His short story collection, Euthanasia, won the first award of the Abu Dhabi Malayalam Samadhan. And his novel, Adu Jibitam, A Goat Flight, won the Kerala Sahitya Academy Award in 2009. And Joseph Poipale is an associate professor of comparative literature at the Central University of Kerala. Please welcome them both on stage. Benjamin, could you come to the uh, podium and read uh, from the book, sir? It's a book described as a strange and bitter comedy in a desert that turns into a universal tale of loneliness and alienation. Sounds like a very interesting journey, so please come, give us some insight, and please read from the book. Good evening, everybody. I am also from Malayalam language. So, let me say two words, a small piece from original, then Joseph will. 
what is this the result of my um, attempt to represent the other side the uh, other side of the clickering experience life of gulf country indian community in the gulf constitutes one of the largest diaspora in the world the true story of this diaspora is not represented in literature especially in english the novel centers around a character called najib who goes to the gulf with a lot of dreams unfortunately he gets kidnapped and is taken to the middle of of a desert and is forced to forced into slavery in an animal farm for more than 3 years he lives a miserable life there devoid of any human company this novel is about ultimate faith and endless hope that helps him survive he learns many lessons from the nature here i am reading a passage that inspires his will to live and survive കഴിഞ്ഞ ദിവസങ്ങളിലത്രയും സ്വന്തം ജീവനെ അടക്കിപ്പിടിച്ച് ആ സസ്യജാലങ്ങളിൽ മരുഭൂമിയുടെ ചൂടിനെയും തീക്കാറ്റിനെയും സഹിക്കുകയായിരുന്നു എന്ന ഓർമ്മ എന്നിൽ വല്ലാത്തൊരു കുളിർ കോതി മറച്ചു വളരെ കുറച്ച് ദിവസങ്ങൾ കൊണ്ട് ആ ചെറുചെടികൾ വളർന്നു വലുതാകുന്നതും പൂവിടുന്നതും കായ്ക്കുന്നതും നാളേക്ക് വേണ്ടി ജീവനെ ഭൂമിയുടെ ഗർഭത്തിൽ ഒളിപ്പിക്കുന്നതും ഞാൻ എൻ്റെ കണ്ണുകൾ കൊണ്ട് കണ്ടു എനിക്ക് അവയോട് എന്ത് ഇഷ്ടം തോന്നിയെന്നാണ് ഞാൻ അവയുടെ അടി അരികിൽ ചെന്നിരുന്ന് അവയോട് വർത്തമാനം പറഞ്ഞു അവയുടെ സങ്കടങ്ങൾ കേൾക്കുകയും അവയോട് സങ്കടങ്ങൾ പറയുകയും ചെയ്തു ആ ചെടികൾ എനിക്ക് പറഞ്ഞു തന്നത് ജീവിതത്തിൻ്റെ വലിയ പ്രതീക്ഷയുടെ പാഠങ്ങളാണ് അവ എന്നോട് രഹസ്യത്തിൽ പറഞ്ഞു നജീബെ മരുഭൂമിയോട് ദത്തുപുത്ര ഞങ്ങളെപ്പോലെ നീയും നിന്റെ ജീവനെ അടക്കിപ്പിടിച്ച് ഈ മരുഭൂമിയോട് മല്ലിടുക നീ കാറ്റും വെയിൽ നാളവും നിന്നെ കടന്നു പോകും നീ അവയ്ക്ക് മുന്നിൽ കീഴടം നരുത് തളരുകയും നരുത് നിന്റെ ജീവനെ അത് ചോദിക്കും വിട്ടുകൊടുക്കരുത് പകുതി മരിച്ചവനെ പോലെ ധ്യാനിച്ചു കിടക്കുക ശൂന്യത പോലെ നടിക്കുക നീ ഇനി ഒരിക്കലും ഉയർന്നെഴുന്നേൽക്കില്ലെന്ന് തോന്നിപ്പിക്കുക കരുണാമയനായ അള്ളാഹുവിനെ മാത്രം രഹസ്യത്തിൽ വിളിക്കുക അവൻ നിന്റെ സാന്നിധ്യം അറിയും അവൻ നിന്റെ നിലവിളി കേൾക്കും അജീവെ ഒടുവിൽ നിനക്ക് വേണ്ടി ഒരു കാലം വരും ഈ തീക്കാറ്റുമായും ഈ ചൂടില്ലാതെയാവും കാലത്തിൻ്റെ കുളിർക്കാറ്റിൽ നിന്നെ ഭൂമിക്കടിയിൽ നിന്നും തോണ്ടി വിളിക്കും അപ്പോൾ മാത്രം അപ്പോൾ മാത്രം നീ നിന്റെ ജീവന്റെ തല പതിയെ ഉയർത്തുക ഭൂമിയിൽ നിന്റെ സാന്നിധ്യം അറിയിക്കുക പിന്നെ ഒറ്റ നിമിഷം കൊണ്ട് രക്ഷപെടില്ലേ സ്തുതിക്കുക നാളേക്ക് കൂടുകയും കായ്ക്കുകയും ചെയ്യുക ചെടിക്കുഞ്ഞുങ്ങളുടെ വാക്കുകൾക്ക് ഞാൻ ചെയ്തു കൊടുത്തു ഞാൻ എൻ്റെ അനുകൂല കാലത്തിന് വേണ്ടി ക്ഷമാപൂർവ്വം കാത്തിരുന്നു താങ്ക് യു winter was also the time when i learned that it was impossible to wipe out life on the earth whatever man's must be for how many months had this desert been lying under scorching heat there had been no sign of life on the on those burning sands as the cold wind blew signaling summer's end a green carpet surfaced on the dry land this was within 2 days of the rain it was as if all sense of life had been lying dormant beneath that brown surface straining to hear the music of resurrection cactuses creepers rock fungi touch me not bushes with shiny leaves and so on and from the ends of the sky came flocks of birds that spread their long wings warbling swallows chattering green parrots pairs of cooing doves where did they all come from the realization that those plants and animals had been lying quietly preserving their lives withstanding the heat of the desert 
filled me with delight. I saw with my own eyes how those little plants grew big, bore flowers and fruit, and concealed life for the future in the womb of the earth. How much I admired them. Those plants taught me life's great lessons of hope. They whispered to me, Najib, adopted son of desert, like us, you too must preserve your life and wrestle with this desert. Hot winds and scorching days will pass. Don't surrender to them. Don't grow weary, or you might have to stay with your life. Don't give in. Lie half dead as if meditating. Say nothing. Convey the impression that you will never resurrect. Secretly appeal to Allah, the merciful. He will recognize your presence. He will hear your cries. And finally, an opportune moment will come for you. This hot wind will blow away. This heat will dissipate. The cold wind of time will beckon you. Then, only then, should you slowly raise your head from the earth, announce your presence, and then quickly bring to freedom, bloom, and come to fruit in the morrow. I lent my ears to the words of the little plant, and I waited patiently for the opportune moment. Now I call on Mr. Agus Nalula to please present the memento of this occasion to both Benjamin and Joseph. This is for both days. Thank you, sir. Our next panelist is Cyrus Mystery. Please come on stage to talk about your work, Chronicle of a Pope Bearer. Cyrus began his writing career as a playwright, freelance journalist, and short story writer. His play, Dungaji House, written in 1977 when he was 21 years old, has become a classic in the Indian theatre in India. One of his short stories was made into a Gujarati feature film. I say it. And he's uh, won several awards. His first novel, The Radiance of the Ashes, was published in 2005. Now this story, the story of tragic love that vividly brings out the degradation experienced by those who live at the unforgiving margins of history. Paris and Legends, more than the 20th century, please. That is mystery. So, basically, I don't know how the small, very small Parsi community compares with other such small communities in the world. But it is Paris for the moment, one of the smallest, as far as I know. And the whole diaspora of Parsis into the, the West, the UK and America and so on, has not, uh, not decreased or increased that whole thing. Uh, so, within this microscopic community, there's a small caste of corpse bearers whose job it is to cleanse the body of the deceased person and prepare it for the final funeral ceremony, and then carry it up to the Towers of Silence. I just read a small excerpt from the novel. Uh, the thing is that the, the whole canvas is very small, but I hope, I, I had hoped while writing it to be able to raise very large questions which had some universal resonance through this process. So, the, the, the 
situation is like this that there is a Parsi high priest whose son is having a liaison with uh, a daughter of a corpse bearer. And the corpse bearer is considered a sort of untouchable, always has been. In the past, it was very severe, the, the extent of the isolation and sex, seclusion, uh, segregation. But uh, now it has become a little more liberal. So this, this is clearly set in the past, in the 1940s, and leads up into the present. So this scene I'm going to read out is a scene where the father, for the first time, the high priest, discovers or hears about this, this liaison between his son and the corpse of his daughter. Enough said, rumbled my father, looking completely distraught. I have heard enough. Not the half of it, Daddy, continued the sea venomously. I haven't told you the worst part. Primo Kata's ultimatum to Pirol is that he wants to meet, if he wants to meet Seppi Day again, he should be willing to marry her and work and live with her at Dungarwadi. Salo Badma. That was my father's only impulse to all post. And for the first time in my life, I saw a spark of hatred in his eyes. But it was there only for a moment before it faded. Meanwhile, Hilla and Vishti were speaking at the same time. An insult to our family, proposing such a thing to the son of a high priest. How dare he talk like that, the drunkard? He should be fat, clocked with sticks and chains. A thousand lashes would be too little. Teach him a lesson, daddy. Complain to the panchayat and get him sacked from his job. Then he'll learn his position. Such insolence. While my mother and brother were engaged in this monody of vengeance, I remained completely silent. My eyes transfixed by the great jumble of my father's grey beard that seemed to me to quiver and twitch ever so slightly. His eyes, beneath those shaggy eyebrows, were on the verge of dissolving into tears. When he spoke, the other two persons in the room fell silent. Listen to me, Shiroz. Without knowing it, you have become entangled in something that has goes back many years. This man has been waiting patiently all these years to find the right moment to plunge his conjures into my belly. And now it's in, he's twisting it. You don't know what this is all about. Thank you. I first to present you with a mentor of the situation. Serena, please give you a note. The next finalist, the fourth finalist, is Mohsin Hamid for How to Get Filthy Rich in Rising Asia. Mohsin Hamid is the author of two highly acclaimed novels, and most recently, The Reluctant Fundamentalist, which was shortlisted for the Man Booker Prize and was made into a highly acclaimed film. Unfortunately, Mohsin Hamid could not be with us today, so Shiki Sarkar of Penguin is here to read from his book on likeness on its themes, etc. Now, Shiki, do come over. It's wonderful when you stand beside me. This is a story of climbing from complete poverty to a mansion, bulletproof car, and bodyguard. Twelve simple rules, and yet it's a novel. How does that work? In likeness. Well, as the view is hinted, uh, Mosin's third novel is a novel like no other. It's a novel written in the second person. Uh, it's a novel with no name. By, it's about an unnamed character in an unnamed city. Uh, but what it is really about is it's about the modern South Asian city. It's about a story from about a man who climbed from poverty to great wealth. Uh, and it is a story of how in Asia today, in the South Asian city, uh, poverty and opportunity exist side by side, twin to each other. I'm going to read a portion uh, of the book that Mohsin did. He's extremely sorry that he can't be here today. 
it's the last, in fact, it's the last paragraph of the book. So you get the very, you get the climax. One day you wake up in a hospital bed attached to interfaces, electrical, gaseous, and liquid. Your ex-wife and son are there, and they look a little too young. And you have a moment of panic, as though you've never left the hospital, as though the last decade of your life were merely a fantasy. But then this pretty girl enters. She too is a little too young, and maybe she has just heard of your heart attack and rushed here from a home in the city by the sea. But it does not matter now. She is here. And she comes to you, and she does not speak, and the others do not notice her. And she takes your hand, and you ready yourself to die, eyes open, aware this is all an illusion, a last aroma cast off by the chemical stew that is your brain, which will soon cease to function. And there will be nothing. And you are ready, ready to die well, ready to die like a man, like a woman, like a human. So despite all else you have loved, you have loved your father and your mother and your brother and your sister and your son, and yes, your ex-wife. And you have loved the pretty girl. You have been beyond yourself. And so you have courage and you have dignity and you have calmness in the face of terror and awe. And the pretty girl holds your hand and you contain her and this book and me writing it. And I too contain you, who may not even yet be born, who inside me, inside you, though not in a creepy way. And so may you, may I, may we, so may all of us from some beyond. Thank you. Thank you, Chiki. Um, the memento is presented to you by Idris Maria himself uh, to be conveyed to Morton. Uh, I'm telling him how sorry you were that he couldn't make it, but uh, we are glad that he sent you in So you. that's plenty of compensation. A big hand to Morton, please. Our fifth finalist is Nadim Asram of The Blind Man's Garden. Naveen has written three other novels, Season of the Rainbow, Map for Lost Lovers, and The Wasted Visual. He has been long listed for the Booker Prize, short listed for the Impact Prize, awarded the Kiriyama, and won the Encore, the Encore Award. He was born in Pakistan, Naveen now lives in London, and in 2012, he was made a Fellow of the Royal Society of Literature. Welcome, sir. So, I don't know, just read this beside you, and I say that this is a story that following 9 11, when Western armies invaded Afghanistan, this book tells a story of war, love, hope, grief, losses, faith. It's a huge canvas. Hear that, Jeremy. Good evening. Um, it's an honor for me to be here and be on the short list. I'm going to read to you um, from the opening pages of the book. But a man's life blood is dark and mortal. Once it wets the earth, what song can sing it back? I stress. Chapter 1. History is the third parent. As the man makes his way through the garden, not long after nightfall, a memory comes to him from his son Gio's childhood, a memory that flows him and eventually brings him to a standstill. Ahead of him, candles are burning in various places of the house because there is no electricity. Wounds are set to emit light under certain conditions. Touch them, and the brightness will stay on the hand. And as the candles burn, the man thinks of each flame as an injury somewhere in his house. One evening, as he was being told a story by Rohan, a troubled expression had appeared in Gio's face. Rohan had stopped speaking and gone up to him and lifted him into his arms, feeling the tremors in the small body. From dusk onwards, the boy tried to reassure himself that he would continue to exist after falling asleep, that he would emerge again into love and light on the other side. But that evening, it was about something else. After a few moments, he explained that his fear was caused by the appearance of the villain in the story he was being told. Rohan had given a small laugh to comfort him and asked, But have you ever heard a story in which the evil person triumphs at the end? The boy thought for a while before replying, 
No, he said, but before they lose, they harm the good people. That is what I'm afraid of. Serena will present you the, the mentor of this occasion. Thank you for your reading as well. Thank you so much. Congratulations. Last but not least, we have Naomi Munavira for Island of a Thousand Mirrors. Naomi Munavira was born in Sri Lanka and through regular visits to Sri Lanka, both from Nigeria and America, where she migrated. Naomi witnessed the devastation wrought on the country of her birth by a terrible civil war. These experiences led her to write her first novel, Island of a Thousand Mirrors, which was long listed to the Man Asian Award and won the Commonwealth Writers Prize for Asia. Welcome. Welcome. This is a book I'm told about. I haven't read it yet before today, but I'm going to. Two families, one family, one cinema, on opposite sides of a long and brutal war in Sri Lanka, a civil war. That's the setting. Share more of that then in Latin. Thank you. I'm very, very honored to be on this stage with all these amazing, amazing writers. Um, so thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, so my book is about the civil war in Sri Lanka, which went on for 26 years. Um, and the section that I'll read today is at the very end, and it is the thoughts of my character about what it means to be at the end of the war. So this is the very end of the novel, and it's her talking about um, what this war has meant to her. I dream of the 80,000 who did not live into this moment. Those who were left behind in the lagoons and paddy fields, in the cement jail cells in the white rounds, beneath the rolling waves of the ocean. Those who were broken, dismantled, disappeared. Those who were shattered in bomb blocks, those who were bludgeoned, burned in tires, thrown from helicopters into the sea. Those who were taken in the midst of giving speeches. Those who were taken from their beds in the night. Those who were lampposted, those who were pitched into the rivers, those who were taken as children, those who were pierced by shrapnel, those who lost limbs to landmines, those who lost eyes and hearts and livers, the tender, pulsating, precious flesh, those who were called to strap bombs onto themselves and detonate. I dream of the one that I can give a name to and that other, her unnamed, unloved assassin. 80,000. It is a number beyond comprehension. I must mourn for them. I must cry and shake and tremble for them. I shall cry for a long time. And then, when my weeping is spent, when I have no more sorrow to give, I shall celebrate peace. I shall wake up from these long decades of war and begin to see what we can do in peace. What sort of creatures are we when the mosque of lion or tiger falls from us? The day is coming, I think, when I will share with my child the ocean she was named after. I shall show her the island, the school children walking home, the girls in white dresses, their hair in coil plaits, their feet shod in pristine white socks and shoes. The boys, arm in arm, wearing white shirts and blue shorts, breathlessly happy and released from the classroom. I shall take her out into the country where the buffalo stirs, in the fluorescent paddy field with a solitary egret on his shoulder. I shall show her the plants that grow giant, twining around trees and jumping into canopy, the aralia that bursts into blossom, scenting the air, the spiky insect-like orchid. We shall go high into the misty pea country where about bowed, sorried women pick tea, where the flower boys race your car down the twisting, turning mountain passes. I shall show her the big white house by the sea, which her mother, her father, and her aunt played games in, were fed in, found each other in. 
but it is the ocean that I long to show her most of all. I want her to learn its depth, know its many blue-green moods, and meet its finned creatures, the many-armed octopus with its all-seeing eye, the schools of silver fish that wait for the turning of the tide, the sinuous, sharp-toothed sharks. I ask that she be at peace in the bosom of, bosom of an ocean-skimming boat, the sea spray sparkling across her features. I want her to know the bare-chested fishermen with their scarlet smiles and dawn-returning catamarans. They will teach her their songs, and I will teach her to dive deep, to become one with the skin of the water until she feels its fluid pulse as her own, to claim this submerged world as her own. I see her emerging from the ocean as she will be in some distant future. She drips sea water. She has grown so tall into a young woman with wild and snaking hair studded with drops of silver water. Her skin is shining dark, polished by sun and salt. She walks in purpose and self-knowledge, a long, rolling walk that unfolds from the hip. She's a child of the peace, the many disparate parts of her her experience knit together in jumbled but peaceable unity. The waves lick away her footsteps, the sand retaining no record of what came before her. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mary. That was beautiful. A big hand for it, please. On that happy note, I'm going to call on stage our chief guest, John Lyston Soul, an eminent Canadian author and essayist. Equally important, he is the international president of Penn International. His philosophical trilogy, Walter's Bastard, The Doubter's Companion, and the unconscious civilization, as well as its final conclusion on equilibrium, is read and taught around the world. Please welcome John Ralston Stoll. Good evening. Uh, I've been asked to say a few words before the prize is announced and Gloria and I uh, present it. Um, this is a very exciting prize. There are a lot of prizes in the world, and a lot of them aren't properly defined. But there's something about this prize, and I have to say to both of you, I think you've fought your way through it, and it makes the kind of sense that means it will go on and on and get stronger and stronger. And I think that sense lies in the regionalism and in the fact that it's open to people, whatever their ethnicity, nationality, or languages, and that it puts a big emphasis also on translation. Because all of us in the world of writing, and particularly in the world of writing fiction and plays and poetry, um, know that one of the big crises out there is there isn't enough translation. And the publishers here are doing a good job, but what I know, for example, as president of Penn International, is that Many people are writing in languages which simply don't have access to publishers to translation. And that is a form of loss of freedom of expression. If you can't get your books published, because there's no publishing system, or you can't get them translated into a wider world, there's a problem. And so I think the fact that this prize deals in part with that is really, really important. And just to put it, in India, one doesn't necessarily talk about you know, small languages or dying languages, but there are many languages disappearing. And when people lose their language, that is the ultimate loss of freedom of expression. I think the, the, the second thing about that regionalism is that it's taking us somewhere new, which is to say that people used to uh, try to move away from localism to the international novel. I never understood what that was, really, because all of us come from somewhere. We're all born somewhere. We all have an experience. And when we write our fiction, it comes out of that place. Whatever we think is somehow influenced by that place. The great novels are all local. 
And if they're great, they become universal because of how local they are. And the third and last comment I'd make is that we've come through, we're not necessarily through it, but we've come through a very strange period of nationalism in which a lot of us felt a lot of pressure uh, to be the writers or novelists of a particular country or a particular region. And of course, we do come from those places, and we do express those places in a way. And you think all six of these have somehow shared this problem of violence in the region. They are about the region, the so countries they are. of the region. But writers don't belong to government. We're not the property of the nation state. We're not people. We're happy to be complimented, but we don't actually function on their behalf. In fact, I would have to say that we don't belong to anybody, in spite of the fact that our novels come from places and speak to those places. And that's what gives the enormous strength to fiction today, because while everybody's debating about how are people going to read things, in what form, the reality is there have never been so many people reading novels. There have never been so many novelists. There has never been such quality of fiction being written, and fiction has never been so true in a way that non-fiction writers are very jealous of. So I'm looking forward very much to hearing who the winner is. And I have to say, I've already read several of them, and I'm looking forward to reading the rest of them. Thank you very much. And I'd also like to call up on stage uh, Gloria Stanley, our special guest, who's here to present your work as well. Welcome, Gloria. You're more than loved in many parts of the world, especially in India. Thank you for being here. I, I actually thought I only had to present this incredible magic check, but um, I would like to say that for me, I think the spider is the nation and patron, patron saint of writers because the spider goes into a secret space by itself and spins out of its body something that has never existed before. So I salute all the writers here, all the writers here, and the magic, the magic of writing. You know, we've heard excerpts from uh, this book, heard great writers, and it reminded me of two things. One is the words of Joseph Conrad, which said, a writer without interest or sympathy for the foibles of his fellow man is not conceivable as a writer. And listening to uh, my chief guest, Mr. Saul, I'm reminded, is reminded of a fellow countryman of his, um, John Murrell, a great Canadian playwright, whose play I had the honor of performing across Canada for eight weeks, coast to coast. And believe it or not, this Canadian writer has written, in my opinion, the finest play on the finest play on Shah Jahan and the whole Mughal period uh, and the creation of the Taj Mahal and the imprisonment of Shah Jahan, which is an epic work. It's a modern day Shakespeare and I thoroughly enjoyed performing it. So, hearing him speak, although he belongs to the world, but with a Canadian tone and accent, reminds me of John Murray, and I wish to salute John here as well for his great contribution. Thank you, John. And um, now, uh, if you please uh, step forward to the middle of the tableau, if I could have John and Gloria sort of there, and if I could have an uh, H's and T on this side, and then I would answer to come into the center to announce the award, and then the winner of the award can come up and claim his rightful due. So this is the big moment. Who will be the winner today? I'm sure you all have your favorites. Everyone can't win. But they're all winners because they're part of the finalists. But one has to be picked for the BSC Prize for South Asian Literature, 
And I call on the chairman of the jury to make that announcement. Thank you very much. It is my honor, on behalf of the jury, to present to you the book. The book is Chronicle of a Cop Bearer by Cyrus Mistry. The jury was practically unanimous in selecting the final winner. The Chronicle of a Corpse Terror is a deeply moving book, exquisitely drawn on a small, almost claustrophobic canvas. It takes a tiny slice of life, the life of the Kandyas, or corpse bearers of the Parsi community, and weaves a powerful story about this downtrodden past we know so little about. A fantastic story. A storyteller, Mystery offers a beautiful novel, rich in historical detail and existential arms, gently questioning the way we look at justice, custom, love, life, and death. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, one final round of applause for Cyrus for this amazing book that got the unanimous vote of the jury in winning the DSC Prize for South Asian Literature 2014, Cyrus Mystery. Congratulations, Cyrus. Cyrus, would you like to share some of your thoughts and how you're feeling at this moment? You want to speak from here or from the podium? Yeah, I'm quite overwhelmed. I think it's a marvelous thing that's happened for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, especially I would like to say a very, very big thank you to Mr. and Mrs. Narula for their extraordinary hospitality and gracious generosity and for what all they're doing for the literary festival and literature. Uh, apart from that, I've tried to be as detached as possible from the possibility of winning this prize. So I'm not going to go into too so much about it right now. But I feel very good about it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And a huge congratulations. There's, there's the award itself. There's the $50,000 that goes with it. And the glory for the rest of your life for having won this extremely prestigious prize that is admired by people and book lovers around the world. I just want to say a uh, final thing. Even with the spirit of the internet, even as the ways of reading books are evolving, the influence of books has never been greater. And all those who write about South Asia have an ever growing worldwide audience and DSC remains committed to that goal. We come to this award, end of this award ceremony with special thanks to the sponsors, to Sanjay Roy, Shuri Shetty, Deepa, um, and Bashar of DSC, Teamwork Productions, and all those that made this a wonderful, memorable evening. Thank you all. God bless you. And good night. Thanks to Kabir Bedi for being such an impeccable MC this evening.